Good morning, everyone. If you're here this morning, it means similar to me. You did not get an invitation to the beach. It's fine, whatever. I do hope you've enjoyed your week. And you had a great 4th of July. I know a lot of people are right now live streaming. They're at the beach. They're somewhere else. And I just want you all to know thank you for wherever you are, being a part of God's message today. And please remember, there have been zero shark attacks on land. Amen, right? I'm staying right here. Y'all can, y'all hang out. Y'all have a good time over there. But also, can we take a second and welcome Metro, our other campus in the Plaza Midwood area. Love them. <laughs> At some point, they will hear this message, and so, so glad that we're expanding in Charlotte and expanding God's kingdom and his glory. So welcome. So if you were here last week, you know that we started a two-week series, and then we're staying in the book of Psalms. And that can be divided into two different themes. The first, this is about your individual relationship with God. But it's also about the psychology that goes into any type of relationship that we're in. We talked last week about your initial relationship with God and with yourself comes from how other people taught you how to treat yourself. And for some of us, that involves shame. For some of us, that's been really messy. And so we, we're looking at our emotional needs. You might remember the ladder we have here, five different levels that we can climb back up, we can have our needs met, and we can learn to love self for God's sake. And that we're called to have a well of his love, his grace, compassion, and love inside of us to drink the living water, and from that place to treat others well and be known by God's love. So we're going to continue that. And if you remember, the third step, the third rung on the ladder is a sense of belonging. And it is vital in our relationships. So we're going to park there today. We're going to hang out there for a little while and talk about our sense of belonging. So I'm a visual learner, so I brought you some pictures. So we're going to start with our first picture. Can we put that up, please, to talk about sense of belonging? All right, who's this? Adam's family. If you're too young to know that, it's okay, God forgives. It's fine. This is the Adams family, right? So you know if you saw them, you, they're the Adams. They belong together. If you saw that little girl separate from her family, you would not be confused. You'd be like, that's, that's, that's an Adams kid, right? There's a likeness in this. These people belong to each other. Second picture, please. Who are these people? Kardashians, yeah, the young people got in on that one, right? Y'all know who these people are. Now, I don't know which one's which. I do know they have a likeness and a belonging in their chaos, in their drama, in their love of money, that there, there is a sense of belonging. If you see one Kardashian, you've seen all of them. They have a lot of likeness with each other. And then our final picture, can you get one more? Who are these? <laughs> the fossils. Yes, these are good Good people. This is your pastor and his siblings. That they belong to each other. If you've been around them, there's a likeness in their mannerism. That you can tell that they're really, truly connected to each other. But isn't that what we're all looking for? Don't we all want to be connected? To be included? To have a sense of belonging? How special it is to be around people who, who know you and they call you by name. Even if you go to Water Bean or Define Coffee or Starbucks. And your barista remembers your name. And on top of that, they remember your high-maintenance drink. All right? There's, there's a warm fuzzy. There's something, there's something about, that, about being connected and being remembered. In Mosaic, even being the size of a church, isn't it great when you come here and there's at least one or two people who know your name? And not only do they call you by name, but they're in prayer for you. They are standing beside you, connected to you, and you know you belong to them. You belong to the church. Actually, the number one reason why people leave a church is they have an unmet need. And the unmet need is usually they don't feel like they belong. They feel rejected. And either they leave the church or they leave the church as a whole. That we're meant to actually connect and belong. And here at Mosaic, we have a saying, we say this a lot, you belong before you believe. My question for you today is, do you believe that you belong? Do you really believe that you belong in relationship with Jesus? Are we able to grasp and believe 
that the God that created the whole world in six days also calls you by name. Do we believe that he really is our heavenly father? How much we are affected by unresolved rejection and our capacity to have a sense of belonging, those two things determine how intimate you will be in all of your relationships. How much unresolved rejection you have will dictate how close you can be to everybody in your life. So I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to be honest. Raise your hand if you've been rejected at least one time in your life. Yeah, okay, keep your hands up if you're excited about the next rejection encounter. <laughs> no, no, we've all been rejected and nobody wants to go through it again. As a matter of fact, research shows, science shows, that when you get rejected, your brain responds the same way it does when you have physical pain. When you experience physical pain, your brain releases a chemical opioid receptor that goes in between the space between your neurons to try to dampen down your pain. When you get rejected, your brain does the same thing for you. And it can be a minor rejection. It could be that you read a text and you just misread it for a second. It can be as benign as someone that you're not interested in, you find out they're not interested in you either. And your brain will protect you and release this receptor to try to dampen down the impact it has on your body. As a psychotherapist, I'm supposed to tell my patients when they come in and they've experienced rejection, I'm supposed to tell them to take two Tylenol to help their body and to help their brain because they've been so hurt, they've been so affected by that rejection. And rejection is everywhere. You know, I don't, I don't know what's worse. I don't know if physical pain is worse than rejection. I recently threw my back out, and I think I'm just getting older, because all I did was sneeze. <laughs> That's it. Listen, I've been sneezing my whole life. I'm allergic to everything, trees, pollen, grass, people, you name it. <laughs> I'm allergic. I've been sneezing as a little girl, and I sneezed on this day, and I threw my back out. So for three days, I was in pain. But I can't describe that pain to you now. I can't tell you about sensation. I, I don't recall. But I can tell you last time that I was rejected, I can tell you what he's wearing. I can tell you where he's standing. I can tell you what he said. Please know it was not Shamar. He and I are fine. <laughs> We're good. The engagement's still on. Don't get upset. I can tell you what I said in response to him. I can tell you the color of the paint on the walls. I remember it that vividly. We've all experienced rejection. We all raised our hands, and it's everywhere. All you have to do is go on Facebook, and you can feel rejected. I don't care what season of life you're in, you are probably emerged in rejection. Middle school. If you're in middle school, God bless you. Like, hang in there. <laughs> High school. Working in a corporation. A corporation, people act like they're still in high school. <laughs> right? If you're married, you're in a family, you're in a church. Rejection is all around us. But we're called to be in this world, to walk this earth, and to not fit in, and for our behavior to show that we belong to God. I think if we're going to do that, we need to know the difference between fitting in and belonging. So I'm going to give you my definition. Fitting in simply means my behavior looks like your behavior. It means if you're drinking and smoking, I'm drinking and smoking. It means that if you're listening to country music, even though I don't like it, I won't say anything, I'll listen with it and sing along with you. It means if you tell an inappropriate joke, even if it hurts me to hear you say it, I will just smile and laugh because I'm in that much fear of being rejected. Fitting in is an active avoidance of rejection. Fitting in is an active avoidance of rejection. You have to actually stifle who you are in order to fit in. Fitting in is obligation. It means you feel like you have no choice. 
sense of belonging. Belonging means I accept who I am and I accept who God says that I am. When you're growing up in the formative years, your sense of belonging is usually to your family values. It's to your last name. But as we spiritually mature, that means that our behavior should reflect that we belong to God. Belonging to God means choice. That he chose you and your behavior shows that you are in agreement and you choose him as well. I think the worship team we have here is, is excellent. And I love worshiping no matter where I am. But when I'm standing there and I'm worshiping and I'm raising my hand in that moment and I'm worshiping, I am in his likeness. I am in God's image. I'm saying, I choose you, God, and I'm glad you chose me. I don't care what anybody else around me is doing. I don't care if you think about what I'm doing in that moment. I'm not raising my hand because the pastor's wife is sitting beside me. And I don't know if she's raising her hair or not because I'm not paying her any attention because in that moment I am saying I belong to God. You belong to God. He chose you. He adopted you. Ephesians 1.5, and they'll put this on the screen for you. Ephesians 1.5 says God in advance adopted you into his family. His family at that time was the Trinity. It was a father the Son, the Holy Spirit. And he brought you into his family through his Son, Jesus Christ. And it's what he wanted to do. It gave him great pleasure. He wanted to choose you. He brought you into his family through his Son, Jesus. Jesus walked this earth. And he was rejected so through all of his ministry until the day he had his ultimate rejection of crucifixion. But Jesus never fit in. His behavior never fit in because he always belonged to God. So we're going to go to Mark 6, 3. We're going to look at one of the many times that Jesus was rejected. I'm just going to give you a summary of this. That Jesus has left his hometown. He's been performing miracles. He's in his ministry. And he comes back, and he comes back with his entourage, with his disciples. And he comes back to his hometown. That means he's now with people he grew up with. These are the people that he played dirt and stones with. <laughs> they all grew up together. And he comes back. And he comes into his hometown and he does what Jesus does. He performs miracles. And then he goes into the synagogue and he teaches. And he taught from Isaiah 61, 1 through 2. And I'll give you a summary. He came in and he said, the spirit of the Lord, the favor of God is upon me. And I'm here to help the brokenhearted. I'm here for the poor. I'm here for those who have been oppressed. I'm here to help those who have been imprisoned. He said, I'm here for all of you who have ever been rejected. I'm here to tell you that there's a heavenly father and you belong to him no matter what you've been through. And his hometown people looked at him and he said, isn't he a carpenter. They shamed him. They said, based on this title, he wasn't good enough. Why would God pick him? Why would he have the Spirit of the Lord on him? He was just a carpenter. They said, we know you. Your brothers and sisters still live here. Why would God ever pick you? And then they said something horrible to him. They looked at Jesus and they said, isn't that Mary's son? Back then, you were never associated with your mother. No one ever said, isn't that Emily's daughter? Isn't that Ashley's son? No one talked like that. You were always connected to your father. What they were saying to him was, you don't even know who your daddy is. Why would we listen to you? You don't know the baby daddy. The irony that these people looked at Jesus, who's saying, you belong to a heavenly father. They looked at the son of God, and they rejected him and said, you don't know who your father is. It's a little bit too ironic, isn't it? And Jesus looked at them, and he said, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own hometown, with his own relatives, his own people. How many of us know what it's like to be rejected by our own family? There's a leading researcher in my field. Her name is Dr. Brene Brown. You've probably heard of her. She studies shame, and she's absolutely brilliant. And she has a quote, and she said, 
Stop walking in the world looking for where you do not belong. You will find it. Stop walking through the world looking for confirmation that you don't belong. You will find it. If they rejected Jesus, what are they going to do to us? We all raise our hands. We've all been rejected. And that rejection is what stops us from knowing that we belong. And while everyone here's rejection may look different, the effects can be the same. I'm going to show you what I think that looks like. I think so many of us have had somebody just come by, especially in our formative years like we talked about last week. And they've punctured you. They've wounded you. And maybe you're, you're the kid who sat at the cafeteria table alone. Felt like you had no friends. Maybe you're the person that got told you were fat or that you were unattractive. Maybe you're the person here that all you did was walk in the living room and your dad would just hit you just for walking in the room. Maybe you're the person here that had to grow up and didn't have enough money and people always made fun of you and never felt like you were enough because of that. Maybe you're here and, and you grew up, couldn't wait to get married and you got married and now you're divorced. Maybe you're here and your heart's broken and you've been oppressed because someone had an affair on you. Or you might be the person who's been in so much pain, you're the one that had the affair. There's some of you here, you've been fired and you felt rejected. Other people here that you never had a parent who invested in you and told you that you were more than, than good enough. We all have had so many different things happen that caused us to be wounded. These are our core wounds. And if you're anything like me, whenever I had all this pain inside of me and people had rejected me, I couldn't just walk around with all these holes. I had to find a way to cover this up. And we talked last week, when there's not a sense of self, then we go into destructive behavior. For some of us, it's perfectionism. We cover it up. We put a Band-Aid on that hole. We want to look perfect so no one realizes how much pain we're in. And others... You people, please. You act like you don't have needs. All of you have developed behavior, whether it's trichlomania, hoarding, or you've done something, video gaming, anything, because you feel like you've got so many holes, you just try to cover the rejection. The problem with this is that when you try to heal on the outside, you put a Band-Aid on that wound, that anybody, even the person that caused the pain, can just walk by and rip it off. See, they're healing. We have to figure out, what's our spiritual Tylenol? It's got to come from the inside. It doesn't always really matter what happened that caused the holes, even though I know it hurts. It's the belief that comes with those holes. When we walk around thinking, I am unattractive, I am stupid, I'm always going to be alone, I'm never going to be acceptable. When you walk around with those beliefs, those are the beliefs that stop you from ever belonging. And this is an inside job. When we start to heal the inside, we will stop feeling left out. We'll stop taking ourselves away from the opportunities to actually connect and to belong. So I'm going to give you three questions to ask yourself whenever you feel some sense of rejection. The first question is, is it the person in front of me or the people behind me? If what just happened current is it the person who just said or did what they did or is it because it's a hole that just the same hole keeps getting hurt over and over and over again and this is something to ask yourself when you get upset when you feel rejected is your reaction proportional because if you get overwhelmed or overwhelmed what happens to you it's probably not the person in front of you it's all the people behind you that have hurt you If you have a pattern, the same thing keeps happening. It keeps reoccurring. There's a possibility it's the same wound that keeps getting re-injured, the same puncture wound. I want to give you an example from my life. And I'm sharing this with you because this is completely resolved. But it had a hole inside of me, and I have for a long time, based on appearance. And so I've I've grown up, and and for some reason this kept happening to me. And it happened, honestly, a lot at church. Anytime I'd be in a group of women standing. So let's say I'm in a group standing out here with five other women, and we're just hanging out. Somebody would walk up, 
and they would compliment every woman in the group but me. They would tell how beautiful she was or how great her hair was or the color of her sweater brought out her eyes. They were, she would compliment everybody in the group but me. It didn't happen once. didn't happen twice. didn't happen five times. Like, it was very repetitious. So the same hole kept getting re-injured. And my first reaction was to be underwhelmed, to act like it didn't bother me because I don't want things like that to bother me. But when you minimize it, it can't get better. You can't heal. So I finally had enough pain, and I, I called out to God. I said, I, I don't get it. I, I don't, why do I keep getting excluded? Why do I keep getting um, taken out of that conversation when this happens? I don't like it, God. I feel rejected. And he said to me, he said, your mission and your purpose on this earth have nothing to do with how you look. You don't need to be complimented. I said, huh. He said, the person that walked up each time to that group, she's mine. She was my vessel. Every woman who heard something needed to hear something that day. You didn't. Psalm 118, 22. The stone rejected by the builders has become the cornerstone. That thing about you that you keep getting rejected about, that pain that keeps coming back up in your life, when we take that thing and we give it to God, we give it to the cornerstone and Christ is the cornerstone, that thing that you've been rejected by will now become part of your foundation for God. The second thing that I want you to ask yourself, am I fearing rejection? Is this same situation happening to me because I'm not having a voice when something happens? Am I more concerned with you being upset with me? Am I more scared of your reaction? Do I want your approval or more worried about your feelings than I am about having a voice and standing up for myself when the situation comes up? If you're more concerned about someone else's approval than God's approval in that moment, you can't be Christ's servant. And what he has for you, what he thinks about you, what's next for you cannot happen if you're being controlled by the fear of someone rejecting you. Romans 2.11 says, God says, I don't care what other people think about you. I don't even care what you think about you. I've already made my mind up. He already calls you his. So I want you to ask yourself, is the person in front of me, people behind me? Am I fearing rejection more than I'm fearing being approved of by God? And the third question I want you to ask yourself is what I do next now that I'm being rejected? Is it going to increase my rejection or my sense of belonging? If you reject me, what I can do to me on top of what you just did makes it, it look pale what you just did. I can really reject me. I'm really good at it. So we have to stop rejecting ourselves when someone rejects us. Romans 8:31 says, "If God is for us, then who can be against us?" I know the answer to that. Me. Me. I can be against me. If I have enough debilitating shame inside of me, enough unresolved rejection, I will never get to Romans 8.32. I will never get to the part that tells me that God sent his son, the resurrection power, to walk this earth and then live inside of me. I won't get there if I take the rejection you did and I personalize it. See, the more I personalize what you say and do, the less my relationship with Christ is personal. I have to really look at what he did. When I look at that cross, I know that he was rejected. And that the tomb is empty. He buried all of that sin, all of that shame and rejection. And then he rose again. And the last thing he said to his disciples before he went to be with the Father was that I'm leaving the resurrection power, the Holy Spirit, the family that you've been adopted into. I'm leaving that inside of you. That means when there's a situation in my life, that that power lives right here. That that living water, that strength, that confidence, all of that resides in me. That's personal. Which means what you say and do, I don't have to personalize it. Whatever we do next, either we become more the rejection 
where we become more personal with who Christ says that we are. Psalm 73, 23. Hey, everybody. <laughs> God said, let there be light. And there was. <laughs> and now you're sinners again. You're back in the dark. There you <laughs> That's cool. Psalm 73, 23 says, yet I still belong to you. You hold my right hand. The writer in this is saying, no matter how much rejection, no matter how much pain I've had in my past, no matter what I've done to people, what's been done to me, yet, God, I still belong to you. You claim me. You hold my right hand. You know how when you're at the mall or you're in public and your spouse or your significant other holds your hand? You're claimed in that moment. You're publicly claimed. This scripture tells us that God says, you belong to me. I hold your right hand. When we belong to him, what he asks of us, the behavior he wants from you, won't make any sense in the natural world. We can go to Mark 14. And this is near the end of Christ's ministry on this earth. And everyone's at a party, and they are hanging around the table, and, and they're drinking um, water. And if I was there, I'd have a glass of water and say, hey, Jesus, turn it to wine. All right, I'm sure they're all <laughs> just hanging out, having a good time. They're eating. They're laughing. And then this woman, she stands up. She takes a bottle of perfume, and she walks over to Jesus, and she pours it on his head. And everybody went crazy. They started yelling at her. See, all their behavior fit in. And all of a sudden, her behavior doesn't fit in. It doesn't blend in at all. And they started screaming at her that what she just did was criminal. And it was wrong. And that that perfume was expensive. That money could have been used for the poor. And Jesus said, let her alone. What she just did for me was significant. He says she did what she could when she could. Meaning what she had was enough. She didn't need any more, didn't need to think any differently. She just knew she belonged to me. You will have the poor with you forever. I'm only here for a short time. She just prepared me for burial. And then whenever this message is preached, she will be talked about admirably. Because she didn't fit in. Her behavior shows she belonged to him. About 10 years ago or so, God asked me to do something that didn't make a bit of sense because I belonged to him. One day, he said to me, I need you to start calling your mom every day. And I said, Father God, have you met her? <laughs> and so let me give some disclaimers on this. Some of you here calling your mom every day, you love doing that. And I'm so glad for you. Other people here, I know you wish your mom were here so you could call her. And I, I understand that sorrow. But for me, it's a little bit different. And I won't give a lot of detail. I will share about this at the next ICU talk, so July 17th. So I won't give a lot of detail. But just know that my mother very much rejected me throughout my life. And if you ask her today, she'll still tell you that I was a problem from the day I was born. She said, I'm still a challenge. I've always been a challenge. And I'm a problem child. But whenever I would call her, she would hang up. If I was in town, I would say, hey, I'm, I want to come by and see you. She said, you stress me too much. Don't come here. She just didn't want anything to do with me. She rejected me my whole life. And so my life had gotten better. I had a good life. And all of a sudden, God says, I want you to call her every day. And I said, why? <laughs> why, God? He said, because you fear her rejection more than you fear me. See, whatever you fear is what has authority in your life. And that's why we're called to fear God. He is to have authority. So either you can serve rejection or you can serve me. And he showed me, he said, the difference is, is that you've been restored. And I wasn't going to go in relationship with my mother anymore, waiting for her to change, waiting for her to be restored. And he showed me that I've adopted you. I chose you. And what you're taking into that relationship with her is the rejection of my son and the rejection that Christ went through with me is, is so much bigger than anything I've ever been through. And I'm to take that resurrection power into it. And that was never to reject me in that relationship, 
that she could reject me, but I wasn't going to reject me because I was holding God's right hand. Psalm 27.10, even if your mother and father abandon you, I will hold you close. And he did. And I will tell you today, the relationship is absolutely restored, but he restored me first. I didn't go into it wanting to belong to her, but today I can tell you I belong to my mother. That took a lot of work and a lot of pain, but I held his right hand the whole time, and he held me close. I got one more picture for you. This is the Donaldson family. It's Mark and Courtney as their daughter, and that's her son, Emmett. I just want to give you a spoiler alert. Hang on to your seat. It's a little girl's adopted. <laughs> I know, people. I know. Things get crazy at Mosaic. I know. So I met Mark first. We became friends, and then Courtney and I became really good friends. I didn't see her kids a lot, but um, I got to become really good friends with Mark and Courtney. And so Courtney learned this stuff about me. She learned this, and, and you probably don't know this about me, but I'm going to tell you, I hate your kids in my yard. I'm telling you. Don't let your kids come in my yard. I dislike it so much. My wireless network is called Keep Your Kids Out of My Yard. I'm serious. <laughs> I'm serious. I don't want your kids in my yard. One day I was at my house, and I was about to leave, and I saw this boy in my backyard. And I just, it was just the back of him. And I was about to open the back door and tell him about the love of Jesus. <laughs> but I watched his mannerism. And so I texted Courtney and I said, where's your boy? She said, he's at some birthday party in Highland Creek. I said, nope. He's in my backyard. See, I saw his mannerism. I saw the likeness. I knew that boy was a Donaldson. But here's the thing, he's also adopted, but he's chosen. That family chose him, and he chose them. And so his mannerism and his likeness is of his parents. That is God's love. You are in his likeness. Isaiah 43, 1 says, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I call you by name. You are mine. We can look around each other. We may not look alike, but we are in God's likeness. You are his image. You are the compassion. You are the grace. You are the walking mercy. You are the walking, living water that's inside of us all. And that we are called to receive his love. We got to get rid of all these holes and heal from the inside and bring the blood of Christ inside of you so that we can stand together, belong to one another, and be known by His love. We've come to that time in our service where that we get to respond. I'm going to ask that you leave here differently than you walked in. That this is a day to have some more intimacy in all your relationships, and it starts right now with getting rid of some of those forgiveness, some of that rejection and bringing in forgiveness. As the last song is played, I'm going to ask if you want to, if it's on your heart, walk over to the cross and write on the post-it note what that hole is. What's that puncture wound for you? And then write, I belong. You don't have to believe to belong here. But today's the day you can belong on a deeper level if you just believe. And if you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we ask that you take communion, bring in the body and the blood of Jesus. And if there's someone here that's been so rejected, whether it's by people or by the church, and they're not here, will you light a candle for them? We want them to walk in here one day and know that they belong here. We don't care about their past. We just want to love them. If you close your eyes, let me pray for you. Father God, we come to you humbly, Lord. We're asking for the spirit of rejection to be broken off of us, Lord. We're tired of being separate from other people. We're tired of our past controlling what happens tomorrow, Lord. I ask that people be relieved today from all those people from those past that caused the puncture wounds inside of them, Lord, that there will be a great, great healing that happens right now in the name of Jesus. 
that we will receive your love in place of all the brokenness. That you sent your son to come for the brokenhearted. You sent him to come for the poor, for the, those in prison, for those oppressed. We're those people, Lord. We're ready to receive. We're ready to drink the living water and to go into a deeper relationship with you, Father God. I thank you. I thank you that this is a group of people who are ready to receive more, Lord. So give us, give us you, Father. May you be the replacement for all the pain that we've had in our lives. Pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Can we stand up, please?